at this point, at this point, I'm not anticipating that the town manager will join us. Right. So we have we have five though. Yes, we have a quorum. Yep. So we can proceed. And again, I think Will will probably be along uh, in a few minutes when he gets his child to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Always a fun test with a little one. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So we have an agenda. I assume everybody's seen it. Uh, I don't have any announcements. Often I do, but tonight I don't. Does anybody else have any announcements? Okay, we also don't have any minutes to review. So that goes by the boards. Um, our main agenda item is talking about financing the housing trust. And uh, I think, although I didn't resend this, that Nate has sent me a file of information about housing trust accounts uh, a couple of months ago that I sent out, but I didn't resend it. I think there are a few things I'll try to do as background uh, before we launch into a discussion. Uh, go look at my notes. Yeah, I think basically we need to talk about what we need funding for, which is not gonna look too different from what we've used funding for in the past. Um, what our currently available funding is by source, and there's uncertainty around that, and what our options for adding sources or increasing amounts. So that's my list of questions we should try to answer as a group. And let me begin with a summary of our types of expenditures in the past. And uh, for the most part, I can't put a number on these. Um, and I'm not sure it's critical to do so. Um, and yeah, Nate just put um, his uh, town finance spreadsheet up. Um, but let me talk about the categories of things that we spend money on. I cannot read that. <laughs> um, first thing is the purchase of Belchertown Road. Theoretically, we spent, I believe it is $600,000 of CPA funds that were actually bonded. So that money is not spent. Uh, well, actually at this point it probably is spent, right? Because we've given the money over to the seller, I believe Nate. And so- right, yeah, uh, it's, it's spent. It's spent. Okay, so that's $600,000 that we spent and that was authorized or recommended by the Community Preservation Act Committee and authorized by the town council. Um, Why did I not understand this? I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, I'm, I should shut up. I'm looking at this and I don't understand what I'm looking at. And well, this is probably not the time to understand it, but at some point I'd like to. Let's come back to it. Cause it's, I think it's easier if I talk about the general categories of expenditures. Um, then we have a series of contracts, either current or past. For example, we have a contract for emergency rental assistance, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and that contract is largely expended. Uh, we had originally allocated $250,000 for that. I know that we haven't spent that. And whether we spend even a significant part depends in, in uh, what happens with the latest version of the uh, federal allocation from CARES to the state and how much of that the state gives to Amherst and how much Amherst allocates to the Emergency Rental Assistance Act. But we could end up, I suppose, not spending any money on this. Is that right, Nate? Oh, no, we'll... Um... <clears throat> My videos, where's my video? The um, the CARES money stopped, I think, as of like January, maybe sometime in January. So everything we're spending, uh, you know, since then is coming out of the trust account. I'm not sure that the, you know, I, you know, I, I agree, John, that it may be that the CARES, the second round of money will help cover this expense. I'm just, I'm not sure of that yet either. Yeah, but even since January, 
um, a relatively small amount of money compared to what we spent in the last six months of the calendar right, right. year. It might only be like 30 or 40,000. Yeah, right. So essentially that's Community Preservation Act money, um, but that is an example of something we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Then <laughs> we also spend, have spent money for the past several <coughs> years on what I would call technical consulting. And that really represents the contract that we have with Rita Farrell, who is not here tonight, who I think all of you know has done a variety of different tasks for us, which are critical to moving us along. And we don't have exactly a, a contract for a fixed amount with Rita. It's flexible, she charges by the hour. And I think over the past three years or more, maybe four years, we are spending about $10,000 a year on average um, for Rita for uh, technical consulting. Does that sound about right, Nate? Yeah, I, mean, I think, um, you know, Rita is under a contract and then sometimes we might, you know, hire someone to do some other site work. Yeah, I was going to add that as other kinds of contracts. Yeah, so yeah, I'd say about ten to twelve thousand. Yeah, um, and actually, we have a special line item from Community Preservation Act just for uh, Rita's services because that's requested separately from other kinds of expenditures. Um, a second expenditure for consulting we have had is for John Page. And John's done some research as well as obviously uh, assisting us with minutes and other things. And I think we've been spending at a roughly a rate of about, oh, 100, 120, $130 a month. And that also varies month by month, uh, depending on what John's doing for us at that point in time. Uh, most of the research actually goes back over a year um, for work that we did on uh, uh, planning for a housing trust or affordable housing policy for the town. Um, then, as Nate mentioned, we spend or have various contracts for property evaluation. For example, for assessing the wetlands, for doing a land survey, for architectural or engineering services. Uh, a lot of that was historically at E Street. And also we had a wetlands consultant for Belchertown Road. So those are again, examples of things that come up as we need them. And we do have Community Preservation Act funds kind of in our bank account that we use to uh, contract for those services. Uh, coming up, there is a plan to replace a conduit along E Street, and uh, we've authorized payment for materials for that. The town Department of Public Works will actually provide the labor for that. So again, that will also come out of CPA funding. And then uh, I think that's that's it for the kinds of expenditures that we've had in the past. I anticipate that those are the same kinds of expenditures we'll have in the future. Uh, although predicting exactly when and where is a little bit more difficult. I mean, I assume we'll continue to uh, consult with Rita. We have a multi-year contract now. Um, John, as everyone knows, has un resigned, unfortunately. And even though I offered him $1,000 an hour, <laughs> he couldn't be persuaded to continue. Uh, okay, so any questions about the nature of those? I think okay. I'll just say quickly, the spreadsheet is showing that the way we, you know, the trust fund is a separate account with the town that the accounting department manages. And there's the, um, the upper line with the available balance of like 37,000. That's uh, funds that are, you know, that are not from CPA necessarily. They're, uh, you know, gifts or donations. And so then the 
the next one you can see uh, CPA. So most of the, the accounts are CPA related and <clears throat> you know they're voted for a specific purpose and then they have you know restrictions in terms of um, you know income limits and other things that have to be used with those. So um, you know most trusts are funded uh, a majority through CPA, but for instance at Belcher Town Road, since CPA funds were used, uh, the income limit is a hundred percent of area median income. So we couldn't actually have any market rate units on that property because CPA money was used for the purchase. So there are some, some reasons why you may or may not want to use CPA funds uh, for certain things, but it'd be really hard to develop a bank account with a few hundred thousand dollars of non CPA funds. Yeah. Let me just mention the one line that Nate pointed out first. Um, I believe, although I could be wrong, that that's all money we received from the interfaith uh, uh, housing corporation. Um, if people aren't familiar with that, the interfaith housing corporation was something that was started more than a decade ago. Um, a group of churches, synagogue, I guess, in town pooled money and they helped to pay for the development of affordable housing in town. Um, it was a time limited. And at the end of the day, the development was sold and the Interfaith Housing Corporation received money among others from the sale. I think they got somewhere or had somewhere in the nature of two to $300,000. I don't know exactly. Most of it was spent on supporting Craig's doors for a period of time. Um, <clears throat> but some of it has gone to Valley Community Development and other funds have come to us. These are pretty much unrestricted, which is important because it's really the only source we have that's unrestricted. As Nate mentioned, um, CPA money is restricted. Um, so I think that summarizes what we have. There are, there's at least one other source of money that we should be getting, although I don't know how soon. We are entitled to a third of the money that the town receives for the short-term rental assistance program. Um, if people aren't familiar with that, short-term rental assistance stands for Airbnb. Uh, and so there are various people in town who have Airbnbs that are registered with the state. The town elected to take a portion of the fees that are levied by the state for people who have uh, those short-term rental assistance programs. Uh, and uh, so whatever it is that the town gets we're entitled to, I believe, one third of it. As it is, nothing has happened to the best of my knowledge during the pandemic. So we're not gonna see any money right away, but as things start to come back, it might generate a few thousand dollars a year. Is that roughly correct, Nate? Yeah, I was just looking, I'm not, um... Um... Yeah, it's 35%. And uh, I just have to look at it. it at one point, it said 35% for affordable housing and uh, local infrastructure. And I don't know if that's, you know, 35% uh, for each or 35% for both. And so then it's, you know, it becomes a local decision as to like, you know, split it up between infrastructure and housing. So but. Okay, I thought it was oil housing. I guess that's my mistake. Yeah, I'd have to, um, yeah, in a short-term rental. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it should be part of the general bylaws now. I was just trying to look quickly. The, uh, they voted it in 2019 and it's a 3%, it's an additional um, tax on, you know, the short-term rental. So it could just, it could also be, um, you know, I don't know if it, I'd have to look, but it could, you know, some communities were, you know, saying, would it apply to lodging houses and boarding houses and other things, or does it not? So. Um, but yeah, um, 
I have to look a little bit more, John, at exactly how that would apply to the trust. Okay, so thanks. From that. Um, I, I really don't need to do this now because maybe only me who cares. But all those lines of numbers across there mean exactly, it looks like you start with $34,000, spend half of it, have half of it left, spend more than you have and end up more than, with more than you started with. Isn't so I don't understand it. Isn't that <laughs> and amazing? I don't have to now, but I'd like to sometime. Accounting does magic with numbers. Um, yeah, no, I think so. You know, I will say that, um, you know, they did move money around. Uh, they, they clarified accounts. And so sometimes these transfers in and adjustments, are, are they are hard to follow. So I think the important number is really that the balance is about 30. Well, I think it's only like about 34,000 now, but there's about $34,000 in the unrestricted account. 34 or 37, which... Which end of the thing is the one that's actually what we oh, sort well, we, of have? We spent money since this report was generated um, on May seventh. We spent money out of this account. So, but yeah, the thirty-seven would be would be correct. You know, so okay. if, we look at this, if we look at that column, then going down as well. So for you know further down, we have you know forty thousand, twenty thousand. Um, you know. Okay. Yeah. And if we have money left, does any in the CPA money, is there ever a point at which you didn't spend it so you have to give it back or anything like that? I, uh, no, the trust is um, explicit. A housing trust, the municipal housing trust is, uh, I shouldn't say no like that, but uh, the CPA legislation allows the trust to, to basically bank CPA money. You know, it has to still be for a purpose. I mean, the trust is only for affordable housing, so it already meets CPA, but a housing trust is essentially allowed to bank CPA money. Um, you know, whereas a, like uh, if, you know, a nonprofit took CP, asked for CPA money and were awarded it, the CPA committee might say, okay, after three years, are you done? If not, you know, you have to give back some balance or if it, you know, the product finishes under budget. Um, I think they, you know, I. They could probably ask that of the trust, but legally the trust is, you know, we can keep all the CPA money that is voted to us, to the trust. So, you know, we still might have to, you know, every year the CPA committee wants an update on, you know, what, has, what's, how has the money been spent? So they still can ask for that, but they can't ask for it back or they could, but we wouldn't have to necessarily give it back to them. Thank you. And Nate, do you know if the money we most recently got from the Interfaith Housing Corporation is included here? Uh, I could look at the details, but um, I mean, it I think came it in just part of that 34,000. Okay, because it yeah. came in just around the date of this report. Right. So that's why I was wondering. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I think it did because um, I think the balance now after spending some more money out of the out of the top line is around 35, 34,000. So I think I think that is the current, you know, uh, includes interfaith money. Okay, then a related question is where else can we find money? As far as I know, there's no other source of income that we haven't talked about uh, beyond the CPA accounts, the interfaith housing corporation and the short-term rental funds. Yeah, I mean, there's donations, um, you know, there's, yeah, I mean, I think CPA is good. There's donations. The town could allocate money directly. You know, there's probably some grant funding the trust could have, could um, acquire, but that's really, you know, for a project or a specific purpose. Um, you know, the, the trust has the power to sell or lease property. So, you know, some trusts might actually broker a deal and then take in money through the sale of property or, um, you know, there's probably some creative ways there, but you know, the trust is a municipal entity. So to, to sell or certain things, the trust has to go through procurement process. It's not as if, you know, the trust could just sell a property and take the money as a, you know, like a private landowner. There's a public procurement process there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think right when we, when the trust was formed and then we had Jen Goals and the consultant look at the strategic plan, I mean, I think, you know, you know, I think like almost most trusts are funded almost solely by CPA, right? It was something like, I feel like most trusts, like 90% of their funding is from Community Preservation Act. It's not very limited from other sources. Yeah, I, 
that's certainly my understanding. Um, and then Erica shared a link in the chat about the um, short-term rental fees. So that's. Okay, I didn't look at that. Well, Nate was correct. It's 35% um, to the affordable housing or infrastructure. Okay. So we have to fight tooth and nail to get our piece of that. <laughs> Good to know. Okay, um, another significant source of funds that the town has used to support affordable housing is the Community Development Block Grant. To the best of my knowledge, the trust has re never really formally considered the use of those funds, except where we know, for example, Family Outreach of Amherst have applied for those funds to uh, support families in need of assistance. Uh, so we have written letters of support for that kind of work or the work done by Amherst Community Connections where they've applied for CDBG funds, but we ourselves have never kind of entered the fray with respect to how that money gets spent. Uh, in addition to the services part of community development block grant funds, there is also a kind of infrastructure or <coughs> Uh, capital part of it. And for example, the town gave, again, without our intervention, Valley Community Development funding originally that they used to search for uh, what became 132 Northampton Road. So they received the CDBG grant to help to finance the costs of that search. Um, anything else people should know about? Community Development Block Grant aside the fact that there's a hearing coming up next week, Nate? No, I mean, I think for the Housing Trust, it's pretty uh, rigorous in terms of how to use it. And so I think, you know, for housing, um, you know, most developers don't use it for, you can divide it up between pre-development, you know, like design and other things, um, and then you can break it up through construction. But if you use it for construction, 51% uh, of the units have to be affordable at 80% or less. And so most developers don't use CPA fund or CDBG funds because it's just, it's too uh, too restrictive with that 51%. You know, it's just, it's too high a proportion of affordable units in most developments. Um, but I think the trust could, you know, always, like I think John Wright, advocacy and, um, you know, supporting programs or activities is probably a good role for the trust, not actually trying to get block grant funds and administer them just because they're, you know, you, we probably have to have a, a separate consultant to do it. Um, I was just looking quickly online and I, and I remember that um, there is a payment in lieu of an inclusionary zoning, uh, the town's inclusionary zoning. So, and um, All right. there's a proposal to increase that, right. that payment and it hasn't happened yet. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty high, it's, you know, you want the, this payment to, be about what it is to develop a unit, you know, the total development cost. And so the proposal is that if a developer has half the units on site, they could then have half the units they could propose to put them off site or make this payment in lieu of. And it's about $320,000 per unit. So, you know, it could be that in the future, a developer, uh, you know, makes this payment in lieu fee and a trust gets a chunk of money. Um, you know, they, uh, uh, Mass Housing Partnership has a few um, other ideas. I, I forgot that, right? There's one, there was, this is pretty new, but uh, cell phone tower lease payments. Some communities have been uh, kind of like this short-term rental fee. They've been negotiating with, with localities to um, have a, some portion of the cell phone tower lease payments if it's on municipal land. Um, you know, they say the developer negotiated fees. So again, I think that's not, it's similar to inclusionary zoning, but you know, some communities might have like impact fees for certain developments that could then go to the housing trust. Um, tax title sales is another one where you could get a proceeds, proceeds from tax title, which the town I don't, I don't think does too often. Um, I think that's it. I mean, I think, um, there's a tax override, which again would have to be probably for a specific purpose. And then 
the town could uh, or the trust could always request you know general fund uh you know like capital money from the town which i don't want to say is unlikely but if we did for instance with communities without uh cpa funding they might actually then make a request and put it in you know the in, you know the actual annual budget process and say you know we we would like to get money from directly from the town and so that's always a possibility uh so you know there's a few other sources it is interesting though that you know, Community Preservation Act is by far the biggest, uh, you know, funding source. Yeah, of the things that you mentioned, I had forgotten, um, but you mentioned the uh, real estate transfer fee, right. I think. That's something that's pending now in the legislature, right. I believe. So yeah. if, if that were to pass, that would mean that the town could adopt, because I think the legislation would require the towns to adopt the transfer fee and then to have that fee go to the housing trust. Right. So that would be another potential source of revenue mm -hmm. that actually has a chance of passage. Yeah, and I think That's what's good. important about some of these other sources, even if they don't seem like they're a lot of money, the, um, uh, the CPA money you know, has to be for um, you know, preserving, acquiring, it says supporting affordable housing. And so sometimes uh, the Community Preservation Act funds, Department of, the Mass Department of Revenue provides guidance on that. And sometimes the Department of Revenue can narrowly interpret what those terms mean. And so for instance, having a survey or go out to a property and do feasibility work, uh, sometimes the, the town accounts will say the Department of Revenue doesn't think that meets any of those categories for housing if it doesn't lead directly to housing. So, you know, if we wanna, if this trust would like to go study a property sometimes, it might be that we have to use those unencumbered or those unrestricted funds because the town might say, oh, well, having someone go look at wetlands on a property really isn't, if it's not gonna to lead to a project, then that's not, you know, that's not CPA eligible. And so, um, you know, I think that and so then those other sources could become really important for some of these pre-development costs, you know, these smaller little um, consultant work. And so, you know, I think, uh, you know, Amherst gets audited and so the auditors look for things. And so, you know, some communities we might, you could go online and do a search and you could say, oh, well, all these other communities use CPA funds to do all these things, which I, I, I say to them anyways. And they'll say, oh, oh, well, but our auditors will tell us not to. And so it's the level of scrutiny that each community gets um, and the interpretation of the CPA language. And, you know, so I think if there's other ways to build up, you know, some type of funding that isn't CPA, it could be really useful. Okay, that I just want to come back to something which I hope everybody understands. And that is the main reason for us to develop these other sources of funding is not because it's likely that we're ever going to pay for an entire project uh, with whatever revenues come into us. It really, in general, means it's money that helps us get started on a project or money that we can use as a match for funds that comes from the Department of Housing and Community Development, Mass Housing Finance, or some other state agency or quasi-governmental agency that looks for a local match when they're putting in the lion's share of funds. And I, I, I hesitate, but I don't think we wanna go into what you need to do in order to access other kinds of funds because uh, there are dozens, I don't think I'm exaggerating, of affordable housing funding streams between the state and the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, which we largely expect the developers to be knowledgeable about and to understand how best to seek those funds. So basically what we're doing is trying to pay for certain pre-development costs or have a match available uh, for those other mostly state, but some federal funding sources uh, that really make up the lion's share of the cost of developing a property. So I, I think 
that's the lesson uh, for today. And then the question becomes, well, how can we expand the funds that we have access to? Uh, typically, we make a request to the Community Preservation Act Committee every year. For the last few years, I've generally been asked, asking for four or $500,000 uh, in funds. For the last couple of years, I think they've given us at least $200,000 a year for housing development and a bit more, as I mentioned earlier, for uh, consulting services. Uh, so that's kind of where we stand. Um, I guess we could also ask the question of, well, how much money do we need? And <clears throat> it's only so fast we can ramp up projects because as you all know, by this point, it takes a lot of time and effort to get a project going not only for people on the trust, but for Nate and other people in town hall. So, uh, not, not to mention the substantial work that developers put into it. So I guess from my point of view, we're not too badly off right now, assuming we can uh, continue to receive Community Preservation Act funding. And that committee has been pretty open to requests, as they say, for the last few years. That's not to say they wouldn't be happy if we had other doors we were successfully knocking on. I know Sarah Marshall, who's the chair, has mentioned that uh, a couple of times. So there definitely is value in seeking other funding, um, but I'm not gonna suggest a bake sale. Carol? <laughs> I'm wondering from now all what you said and how much of the money that we have seems to be earmarked for things how did we have $250,000 to do an emergency rental assistance program? Where did well, that come from? Because we started out thinking we were actually going to pay for it, right? Before there was the CARES thing. How were we going to do that? That was CPA money. So the trust, you know, for the last few years, the trust, like I said, can bank CPA money without a specific purpose or project. So the trust had asked for money just to capitalize the trust, right? Had asked for CPA okay. money just to go into the general trust account. It wasn't for, you know, a specific development. It was basically for affordable housing. And so the um, emergency rental is considered support for affordable housing. So it meets the CPA uh, criteria. So it could be used for, in that respect. Okay. But so then that didn't show up on that little chart of things you showed us, did it? It did. There was an encumbrance for it all, but then because um, CARES money had been spending some, paying for some of it, you know, it was it was, it was hard to track. So I, I can get okay. A, that's okay. More that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, I will also say, because there could have been questions raised uh, raised about our authority to do this. I was in contact with Nate Buddington, who was the chair prior to Sarah Marshall, and I had suggested that we have a joint meeting with CPA to talk about the emergency rental assistance program. And Nate was interested, Nate Buddington I'm talking about, but at the time, uh, the town was restricting the number of new committees that could go up on Zoom. And so it was not possible for him to set up a meeting. So Nate was in favor of it. And as long as he was happy with it, I was happy with it. And so we, you know, felt comfortable with the interpretation that Nate Malloy just gave us. But we didn't just go ahead and do it. We actually, or I did try to seek the blessing of the Community Preservation Act Committee. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So John, I'm feeling very um, ignorant at this point because um, I, I think I was one of the people who thought it would be really important to uh, have sustainable funding and secure funding, but I thought the spectrum of our ability to um, support affordable housing was from rentals to subsidizing mortgages uh, to doing many more things than, than um, doing a, um, a big project like uh, you know, Belcher Town and East Street Road. Well, theoretically, we can do any of those things, Erica. Um, you know, uh, 
to give an example, talking about subsidizing rentals, the Community Preservation Act Committee has funded funded rental subsidy program, not just the emergency rental assistance that we came to them with or that we use their funds for, but also uh, funds that Wayling and particularly for Amherst Community Connections has requested. So there's nothing to stop us from designing or developing a program for rental assistance and saying to the Community Preservation Act Committee, um, we think funds should be allocated to support this or for using funds that we already have. Um, <clears throat> You know, the, the only question is, how many times can we go to the well, whether it's money that we already have in our accounts or additional funding that we're going to ask for? So from that point of view, we would probably ideally need a fiscal plan. So let's say we wanted to spend $100,000 a year on rental assistance. We thought that it was important to have a permanent rental assistance program in Amherst um, it's not unusual for programs like this to list to exist, and you could think of them as a local mobile rental voucher program. And uh, it's something that could be subcontracted or contracted to the Amherst Housing Authority. And as they accepted people into the program, they could also uh, put them on the waiting list for the regular state or federal mobile voucher program. And then as they got into that program, it would free up funds in the local voucher program for another household. So yeah, we can. those are things that we can do, Erica. Um, we need a plan and then we need to say, okay, where can we go to get funding for it? Um, and can we rely on Community Preservation Act funds, which we can. As I said, it's just a question of how many times you go to the well. Or can we find other sources of funds uh, that we can use for that purpose, like short-term rental funds if they come in, uh, or we couldn't use probably the inclusionary zoning uh, funds for that purpose. We'd probably be limited to housing development for that. Um, as far as uh, real estate transfer fees, uh, again, I don't know what limitations there would be on that, but there may be some. So essentially we have to decide what we wanna do programmatically. Um, mostly we've been focused on rental assistance, although we have at least sent letters of support to CPA, as I said, for um, other rental assistance programs or for, uh, for example, Valley Community Development's uh, home ownership, low income home ownership program. So it's really a question of what do we wanna push? What from a programmatic point of view, we want to make a priority. I think Eric, you had a good, I think, you know, John's answer too, it reminded me that, you know, in Amherst and in the area, we have a lot of programs. There's a lot of agencies that do things. So, you know, you know, is it really the trust role to do a first time homebuyer program if Valley is successful? So do we support or facilitate agencies that are already doing certain programs and couldn't we coordinate better between agencies? So I, I can see that the trust role in some of these instances may not be to administer and spend money on its own program, but maybe to we could work with and develop a program, refine it with another agency or help with outreach or maybe some funding. But, you know, I think like Amherst Community Land Trust and Valley CDC are doing a first time homebuyer program. You know, in Amherst Community Land Trust, when they receive CPA funding, they realize that the homebuyer program actually is pretty complicated. So then they use, they had Valley help administer it. So, you know, in our area, Valley is kind of the expert in that. And so, you know, the trust could help fund it. We could help, you know, support somehow. So I think, Hearing John speak, it made me think, yeah, I think there's, we have our list of priorities and our strategic plan. And then there's a question of, you know, are some of those items being taken care of by other agencies and how, how do we develop partnerships or could work with them, you know, or augment each other? Because, yeah, I mean, I think the, the trust has a lot of, legally, the trust has a lot of ability to do a number of things, you know, in the bylaw, you know, we basically adopted 
every power available and authority available to the trust, you know, in terms of, um, you know, hiring a consultant, uh, entering into contracts, you know, leasing, holding property or title. And, you know, some, some communities may want, they may, they adopt a narrower um, authority for the trust. The trust can only do like three things. Essentially, we, we said like, you know, 14 things that the trust can do. So, um, but, but I, I agree with John that we have to kind of set priorities and focus and then see, I think, you know, we do have limited resources, unfortunately, um, but how can we, you know, how can we bolster those, you know, or augment those with someone else? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Nate. I don't think by and large, we want to administer programs. We want to do what we did with emergency rental assistance, which is to find another entity that is capable of doing that kind of administration and contract with them to do it. You know, I, I wouldn't want to invent a new uh, home ownership program. As Nate said, we have Valley has a program, Amherst Community Land Trust pro has a program. And while people don't always think of it this way, Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity also has a home ownership program. So we've got three home ownership programs already operating in Amherst. The only problem is they don't develop many home ownership opportunities in any year. So if we think that should be a high priority, then we can say, okay, um, we, we need to find a way of supporting them. So they do more than one or two or three average new home ownership opportunities a year. Um, and then we become part of the <clears throat> advocacy group, uh, essentially asking CPA or other sources to fund those. Because um, they know what they're doing by and large. They just don't have enough money to provide more home ownership opportunities. And I think that can be said about anything else that we do. Uh, we don't want to be an administrator of a program. Um, we want to set them up. We want to expand opportunities for affordable housing. But at the end of the day, we don't actually want to be directly responsible for them. Um, so does that answer your question, Erica? Yeah, actually, I'm in agreement with exactly what you said, but I think, you know, my concern is that since it takes such a long time to create affordable units, are there places where we can utilize our money to support those organizations all the way from homelessness, all the way to get people into affordable units? That was, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. That was sort of more my point. Yeah, I mean, there are ways. Um, and you know, with Nate and I have emphasized, as with anything else, we have to make choices and say, okay, this is what we'd like to see. And because uh, you're right, the development of uh, affordable rentals takes a long time. Uh, on the other hand, Tom Kegelman would kill me if I said that we should spend a lot of our money on other things because <clears throat> the leverage that we get from rental projects is considerable and greater than almost anything else because the cost per unit, once we get a rental uh, development going is much less than it is for uh, other kinds of projects. But we need to have a balance. We need to do a bit of everything. That's what the town needs and that's what we should be focusing on. And, uh, it's one of my great disappointments with uh, uh, town council's attempts to develop a comprehensive housing plan. Uh, they don't seem to get it. Okay, so then where do we go from here? Which is to say, what would we like to see happen and how are we gonna organize ourselves to um, make those things happen. Uh, 
I mean, I guess I'd be interested to see the impact of the moratorium lifting and to see what that's going to do in terms of evictions and um, people needing emergency rental assistance and if that's an area in the short term that we might think about focusing on to keep people in whatever affordable housing they might have already or to keep them from entering the cycle and having an eviction on their record, which will make it ultimately much more difficult to find housing again. So that would be, I guess, something to keep an eye on. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Allegra. Everything I read on kind of national reports suggests that the effects of the end of eviction moratorium have yet to be felt for many households. There are lots of households that are standing uh, in need of that kind of support, um, whether they know it or not. Uh, on the other hand, I did ask for a report, and I'll just offer this to you since it's, yeah, it's the next agenda item anyway. Um, I got an update on our emergency rental assistance program from Jana Tetro of uh, Parner Valley Community Assistance or I guess it's Community Assistance Pioneer Valley. Anyway, uh, in the last month, Janet reported that they had five new applications. One person was from Taunton, so they referred that person or household to a program near them. Two are still incomplete, and unfortunately, staff have not been able to contact those, those applicants. Two others are in process. Overall, there are three applications in process, the two new ones I just mentioned, and one from a previous month. Um, also, two applications have been approved since Jana's last report um, for a total spending of a little over $2,300 just for those two applications. So at this point, they have only three applications pending or nearing completion. And as I say, they're looking at very few applications a month. Um, I think I reported at our last meeting that the evidence, <clears throat> excuse me, is that Wayfinders has suddenly perked up with respect to its Amherst application and its awards. And people may recall that because it's part of the state's RAFT program, it's a much more generous program. So. Uh, I believe it's since March or maybe even a little bit earlier, they've started to spend much more money um, generally, but in Amherst particularly. So it may be that people are going to them and not coming to us. Uh, as I said, possibly because it's uh, a more generous program. Maybe at this point, people are hearing about that and are hearing less from us. Uh, I really don't know. Um, but at this point, there's no reason for me to think that we should be keeping our program open. We can consider reopening it. Um, and to do that, we'd have to write a new contract with uh, Community Action Pioneer Valley or with somebody else, because uh, they've expended all of the administrative funds that we gave them in their original contract, and we're still waiting, as I mentioned, for a few other applications to be approved. Um, at this point, a uh, question Nate raised with me, if they're approved after June 30th, when the program formally ends, do we still want to apply trust funds to pay for them, assuming that no other funds are available? And I'm going to think that... Uh, your answer would be yes. Yeah, so you know, um, community action. There's probably a, a handful of applicants, for instance, that are still applying because the program's open, and they're not. You know, they may not be eligible for retro payments. You know, they're not behind in rent, so they would be eligible moving forward, which forward, which may be months July, August, September. But you know, essentially, community action's contract is done, so they can they can verify that the um, applicant's eligible and that those are the future months. And then, you know, the town, we can just process payments, but we would just, you know, I'd want, you know, if it, I feel like the, 
and want guidance from the trust on if we want to do that. Because some programs, they just end June 30th. So, you know, if, if you apply now and you don't have any rental arrears, you actually, you might be eligible, but you actually don't get any, any assistance because the program's done this month. And so, I, you know, we hadn't really talked about that ending transition, how we want the program to end. Is it, you know, and like I said, it's not many tenants, but there are a few that, yeah, we're talking about a small number of people who are either now in the pipeline or might enter the pipeline between now and the end of the month. It can't be very many. So I think we should vote to uh, approve any awards that uh, Community Action Pioneer Valley makes, um, even if they involve months past June 30th. So I will move that we do that. Is there a second to the motion? I second. Okay. Um, I just asked you a question. Yes. Is are there any are there that means that there would be three months or is it six months? I can't remember. How many months could it stretch out after that? Well, three. I think we're still doing a three, three month, right? Yeah, three months, and then they could, you know, they'd have to essentially apply for a second time so but you can't apply for a second time because it's closed so there's three months right and presumably the town would have to be willing to make the payments because community action wouldn't is that true and so just if that is true seems yeah, like we have to know that town's willing i don't know yeah, we we make the payments anyway so what happens oh, now okay. is community action will send us a monthly bill but then you know if if they're like you know a half a dozen um applicants i would just have them forward me the information at the end of the month and i would just take care of it you know going forward for the next few months great i don't i'm for it uh, anyway but i just wanted to know <laughs> a couple of things yeah yeah <laughs> no i mean we the way it works is because it's a really interesting um when this program was set up we have to make a payment directly to the landlord not to the tenant and the town has to make the payment because if we gave the money to community action, it'd be a different type of contract and procurement. So uh, uh, we set it up so that, you know, we're the community action helps administer and uh, verifies eligibility. And then the town really works with, you know, secures the contract with the landlord and makes the payment to the landlord. Okay. So that's not that different anyway. Right. Okay. Not that much different. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay. So uh, is there any further discussion or questions? Okay, then I will ask you to say yay or nay uh, to vote to um, pay for any pending applications that are approved by the end of June. Uh, let's see, I'll begin with Erica. Yes. Carol. Yes. Rob. Yes. Will. Yes. Allegra. Yes. And I'm a yes. So that's six to zero. That is settled. So I have a different type of question. <laughs> so um, this is exactly sort of the, the question I had around the funding. So if Wayfinder is spending money on residents that are from from Amherst and we have money left over, can we give money to Wayfinders to spend money on residents from Amherst? No, we, we would have to contract with them okay. uh, in order to have a way of paying for them. But as it stands now, I mean, again, I don't think that the raft funds are inexhaustible, yeah. but uh, at the moment, I have not heard that the state is going to run out of funding for raft. The state continues to receive new money from the federal government, which is it's allocating to raft. I'm pretty sure that's part of what the governor did in his budget, which I guess is still pending before the legislature. Yeah, I think the difficulty there too would be, um, you know, I don't know if, if we if we could though donate funds or somehow do that to an organization. Can they then earmark the money just for Amherst residents? I feel like it'd be, it could become a complicated <laughs> process, but. Yeah, I think we just need to keep an eye on it and talk to people in the local community who are advocates and ask them if they see uh, people running into trouble. 
uh, mostly, I think, my own experience, I would rely on uh, Lori Reichman and Francine Rodriguez at Family Outreach of Amherst. Um, and then there's a couple of other people who I've been in contact with as well, um, whom I could ask, who serve informally as advocates for people in a couple of the housing developments. Yeah, yeah, and I think Allegra, that's a good, uh, it was a good point. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I have been emailing with Jana from Community Action, and even the applicants that are applying now, many aren't behind on rent. And so, you know, it might just, it might actually take like a year for, for everything to, you know, everything to catch up, right? Like, it's unfortunate, um, you know, people might be exhausting their savings and then not thinking they're eligible for a program. And so I, I, I just feel like even though we've tried to get the word out, it's interesting. Um, you know, I just received a phone call from, you know, from two, two households and they're saying, yeah, I, I'm not behind on any payments, but we're spending down my, our savings. I'm saying, well, here's a number of programs called reach out to people. It, you could be eligible, but they don't think they are because they have money and they feel like, oh, there are probably households that need it more. And it's, it's like, wow, really generous of you, but it, you hate to think that they're going to spend every last penny they have now. And then, you know, in a year, they're going to be real. That's when they're really going to have the trouble, right? They're not going to have any trouble. You know, they've even said, oh, I, I, you know, we can make it for the next six months. It's then after the six months, you know, next year is when we're going to feel it. So I feel like, I think if people are, if people are able to uh, get by now, I do. I think that in a year from now, we, you know, or next spring, we may have to reassess how, how we spend money on certain programs or what's a priority. I talked to one woman, this is now a few months ago, um, who is a renter in Amherst and has a school-aged daughter and they live together. She said that she had borrowed money to have it available in the event that she ran short of funds to pay for rent because nothing would be worse to her than becoming homeless and being a force to move who knows where with her daughter and disrupting their lives. So people are doing things to try to protect themselves as best they can. Um, you know, when you would say, well, gee, they should really be coming to us or coming to Wayfinders for assistance, but uh, there's no way we can force them or I guess do more than we already have to encourage people to do what they need to do. Okay, let me go back to financing. Okay, we, we've now talked about financing uh, and come to the point, which I said earlier is, what is it we wanna finance? And how much of a budget should we create to support that? You know, do we wanna see $100,000 a year or more in Community Preservation Act funds go to support home ownership programs? Would we like to see $100,000 a year go to a regular local rental assistance or mobile voucher program or potentially more money? How much do we think should be spent on uh, development of uh, regular rental programs like the one we're doing with Belchertown Road and East Street School or others that might come up from a developer who finds a way to do development in Amherst? Um, you know, what do we want to do? And uh, within a month or two, it's going to be time for us to go when everybody else goes to the Community Preservation Act Committee and make a pitch for how much money we think should be spent and on what kinds of programs. And again, I've done that every year for the last few years. I've generally stuck to uh, our own rental development and just uh, again, with your blessing, uh, provided support to the other kinds of programs. But maybe we should be pushing for more CPA funds to go in annually into home ownership or into something else. Or, 
I don't know really, but the one thing that I like about trying to encourage development is there's only so many places to develop anything. And if we don't encourage that they be affordable developments, then they won't be. And the place will be gone for them for any kind of development to be. And so there's some some something about that uh, pushes me in that direction. I'm not that any of the other things aren't important. And if I thought there were a way for that to be not only rental development, but also some brilliantly thought up home ownership, I'd build con low income condos and have people get a start at being homeowners. That would be great. I don't know what that program is, but but the thing about some amount of development is just that Amherst is a finite piece of property. So 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 I said that already. I'll stop now. Yeah. Well, I I agree, Carol, and um, you know I do have a thought about what we could do to do a home ownership development. Uh, which I've mentioned and which I'll come back to a little later in our agenda. But yeah, I, I think that would be a good thing to do. And uh, it'll be costly. So somewhere someone will have to come up with the money. But I believe that uh, with some local match, uh, it's possible to get that funded by mass housing finance. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have Francis on the call tonight uh, to back me up, but that's my understanding. And there's a lot of discussion around town about the idea of promoting more home ownership. And so I think that is something that we could potentially do. Um, I mean, we have our priorities in our strategic plan. And Eric is shaking her head, yes, because she's the person who's most immediately familiar with those. Um, and they do include things like we've been discussing. But then the question becomes, okay, in the next month or two, we need to make a proposal to the Community Preservation Act Committee. What do we want to put in it? Well, since I'm the one who raised about other um, affordable housing and, and homeless support and just listening into the conversation. I think, you know, what's important is where can we make the highest impact? And from listening to you, it seems that by supporting other organizations that are doing the things that they do best, which is, you know, focusing on homelessness, focusing on rental subsidies, focusing on subsidizing uh, mortgages. And it seems that we have the biggest impact on development that maybe that should be our priority, um, especially in terms of what Carol just mentioned and you mentioned in terms of possibly condos or maybe small housing developments. But to really, if that's where we make the most impact and we can make the most impact, then that should be our focus. And then of course, supporting the rest either through um, you know, going to town council or CPA or writing letters or doing articles, then that's what we do. Okay, well, I will start thinking about what to say to the Community Preservation Act Committee and maybe begin to draft something between now and our meeting in July and uh, see what you all think. I mean, the way we can do the kind of support for other organizations is to do the same thing we did for emergency rental assistance. We can write a request for proposals we can ask for money to support it. And then we put the request for proposals out. And if it's a home ownership, a small home ownership program, then Amherst Community Land Trust or Valley Community Development or Habitat can bid on it, depending on the nature of it. And that's what happens. If it's gonna be uh, to build, say 20 to 30, new affordable home ownership units, then we'd be looking for uh, Valley community development, home city housing, wayfinders, or other potential uh, development agencies to bid on that. But we can do exactly what we've been doing without saying, okay, we're gonna be the developer or we're gonna administer the program. 
and then we uh, we can put something in like as you can we because we can maybe do some of the pre-development work or there are some little pieces that we can do that make it more uh promising or at least make there a little bit less that maybe the developer has to has to take on so it seems like we can like if we take our little bit of money and put it in the right place we can we can make it uh do bigger things exactly carol so you want to set things up to make it easier and more attractive for a developer to come in and follow through and that's what we've done with belchertown road east street we've tried to do everything we could to make the opportunity attractive to potential developers. And that's what we need to continue to do. Okay, um, let me move on to the next item. Um, let's see, I had uh, state legislation. Will, is there anything that you wanna to bring to our attention? I haven't been paying attention myself yeah, well, there are two things, one of which I've been wanting to talk to for a while, but I missed a meeting a couple of months back, and then we've had other things to discuss in the last few meetings. Um, but this one is the uh, the local options transfer tax, uh, which I mentioned a while ago, um, which just to refresh everyone's memory, speaking of financing the trust, um, this is a piece of legislation that would allow uh, each town on a town by town basis to pass uh, a tax on basically luxury luxury property or luxury real estate sales. Um, and the proceeds from that tax would go directly to um, affordable housing trusts in those towns. Um, again, like this legislation wouldn't pass it, it would just basically allow town council to then subsequently pass it. Um, but it seems like a cool idea. Uh, Joe Comerford uh, is sponsoring legislation already. Um, I don't know if Mindy Dom is, I, I assume she's supportive of it, but I don't, I don't think she's uh, she's a co-sponsor at this point. Um, but with respect to the local options transfer tax, um, you know, John, you'd propose a format with respect to sort of the way the shape this ad advocacy could take is that we uh, propose a motion that we write a letter of support um, to, you know, our, you know, both like Mindy and Joe, um, in addition to, you know, the state speaker, or the, 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 the speaker of the house and the president of the Senate and, um, and also the town council asking them to endorse it as well. Um, so I, I would propose that we do something along those lines with respect to um, the local option transfer tax. Um, and then uh, the second item um, is, this is, <laughs> It, it may be too late. Um, apparently, they uh, there was just a vote on it today um, in the in the in the Senate. Um, but the the bill to end the um, let me see. I'm sorry, I'm just pulling up my notes on it. Um, the bill to end the the, the state of emergency, um, the the governor's state of emergency. Um, there were a couple of provisions related to. I think I actually heard Allegra uh, reference this earlier about. Um, ending the eviction moratorium. Um, and there were two amendments um, in the original or that, that had been proposed that were subsequently withdrawn. Um, one of which was to extend the eviction moratorium. The other was to close uh, was to close an eviction loophole. So apparently there's a provision in, the, in this bill that would allow for uh, no fault evictions. Um, and uh, both amendments the, the, the two amendments, one was, were, 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 one was to extend the, the moratorium, and the other one was to uh, prescribe um, these, uh, these no-fault evictions. Um, and both of them were withdrawn in this round. Uh, the bill was voted on in the Senate and is now moving on to the House. I don't exactly know whether or not um, there is uh, leeway for advocacy at this point. <laughs> um, but in the event that there is, um, I, it would be, I think it would be a good idea to send a letter to at least touch base with Mindy and see, um, see where she stands and, you know, similar sort of, uh, yeah, approach to, to advocacy with respect to, to this bill. Um, so th those, those are the two, I'm sorry, what was that, Carol? I just wondered if you could give us some idea what the heck a no fault eviction even means. Um, so no fault evictions, you know, for example, you know, it would be 
Um, I, oh goodness, my, 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 my housing court days <laughs> are, are far enough behind me that I'm trying to think of an example and I'm coming up blank. Um, but you know, basically like there, there are three types of evictions. There's, um, there's eviction for non-payment, which is, you know, if you are in arrears, um, then there's a four cause eviction, um, which is, you know, if you violate a term of your lease and then there's a no fault eviction, which um, basically is the landlord wants you out for no particular reason. Um, they refuse to move through, they, they refuse to renew your lease. Um, and then they try to get you evicted. Um, on account of that. Um, so, so this would guard against that. I mean, the, uh, so, so yeah, basically it's, it's great that it has been, you know, just because there's been such flux and flows of people that it's been, it's been pretty helpful that there have been, uh, there has been the moratorium, the moratorium has extended to no, uh, no fault evictions. Um, so, but yeah, does that answer, answer your question? Uh, no. Or Allegra, do you, do you go ahead, Allegra? I'm trying to remember if, like, if a landlord is foreclosed on, and the tenant has to leave because of that. If that falls into that category, perhaps as well, like, would that be, um, or would that? I don't know. Um, I mean, I know, for example, like, I mean, so so leases survive transfer of ownership typically, and or at least residential leases do. So, um, you know, for example, like a bank forecloses on a, on a property and the bank becomes the landlord and they don't just get to evict right away. Um, but but it, it, it may, it, there may be some circumstances which that's true. I might have just had the whole thing the wrong way around. I thought you were saying that because this amendment did not go through, then no fault evictions would be allowed. But I think you're saying they won't be allowed because it didn't go through. I want to make sure I got it the right way around. <laughs> so because the amendment was withdrawn and not included, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure the state of the bill as it is right now is that no fault evictions would be permitted unless this amendment were included somehow in the House version of the bill and then passed and also included in the reconciliation process. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. This Unfortunately. Is... Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those are the two things on the, on, on the agenda that I was hoping to flag. Um, the option transfer tax or the local option transfer tax, um, that one has a little more leeway. It's a little more, that's, you know, that's on a, that's in the, that's in the slow cooker. Um, and the, uh, the, these two amendments related to the, um, the end of the emergency and to say the emergency bill, um, you know, it, it may be too late because um, again, the Senate voted on it literally just today. Um, but, you know, we could at least take a stand and, and stand up as a, as a, as a body to, to advocate for those in principle if, if it's not in effect actually going to make a difference. Um, okay, well, I think the real estate transfer fee is pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, so I'll ask about that first. Is there anybody who thinks we should not go on record as supporting that and asking town council and our uh, Senate and House representatives to support that? Okay, so uh, I guess I'll make a motion saying that we, as a housing trust, send a letter in support of the real estate transfer fee bill uh, to the appropriate parties and ask them to do what they can to, to make that happen. I will second that motion. Okay. And I'll go around and ask if everybody's in favor of it, Will? Yes. Uh, Allegra? Yes. Uh, Rob? Yes. Carol? Yes. Erica? Yes. And I'm a yes too, so that's six to zero. Uh, Will, can you draft something that I can send out? Sure. Okay, that would be great. And as soon as you get it to me, I will do my best to get it out to the various parties. Great. Uh, okay, so then the question becomes, what should we do about no fault eviction? We can generally, as you were suggesting, take a stand against no fault eviction 
and ask the governor and the legislature to do what they can to block that. Uh, is that what you think we should do at this point, Will? I think so. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, does anybody have another idea? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not more creative. <laughs> about how to approach this. No, that's fine. I just want to be sure that uh, we understand what we're talking about. Okay, so then I'm, I'm going to make a motion that, again, we send a letter to the same parties saying that we are in support of making no-fault eviction part of state statute. And again, asking various parties to support that, uh, to try to make that happen. Is there a second? I will second. Okay. Uh, are there any dis further discussion before we come to a vote? Okay. Just so we get it the right way around. We do not want no fault evictions. <laughs> No, no fault evictions. Right. right. Uh, yeah. and again, <laughs> I got it backwards too easy. It was maybe yeah, just was, me being. I was trying to look too. I know, I thought, I don't know, maybe it was in there. There was also, um, or I thought the bill this year too was to seal no fault evictions. I was wondering but, about that too. Yeah. And I, I can't tell if it, I was trying to find, look quickly to see if that actually passed, but there was, you know, an effort to seal those because, um, you know, they can go, they can work against a tenant. So even if they happen, then they can't be part of a public record so that, you know, they can't be used to discriminate against a, a future tenancy. So uh, I think that could be some of it. So I'm not sure if that's on the books either. What I recall is that the legislature did pass a limited eviction seal bill, but it was limited. It didn't include all of the provisions that the advocates had hoped for. And I don't know whether a broader bill now is before the legislature or whether uh, that's something that would have to be brought back in another session. Right. But I, I do know that something passed, um, I believe, last December. Uh, I just don't, I just can't tell you exactly um, what it did or did not include. Right. I'll, I'll look into it and report back yeah so susan's been putting in the chat some questions and i think you know a no fault eviction it, you know what i was reading is really about you know their tenants at will who don't have you know maybe a month to month but not a long-term lease and so the landlord has to give them the you know a notice just for the you know what their payment period is and then they just say they're out so um you know i think that when a lease ends, a, a landlord doesn't have to renew. That's not necessarily right. eviction. It's when you get noticed uh, that becomes the eviction. Um, okay, S Susan, do you want to raise your hand and say something in addition to what you put in the chat? All right, Susan, you can uh, unmute yourself. Hey, Susan, oh, sorry, guys. Up. Yeah, it's 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 um, I still can't haven't gotten the complete hang of this zoom, even though I'm a teacher for heaven's sake. No, also former <laughs> lawyer, like Will was saying, I did some housing court stuff. And I know, um, you know, I think a lot of landlords have been chattering about, oh, we have it so bad. And we have no recourse and this and that. But I have heard tenants complaining, I, this woman I thought of in Amherst, where she said, oh, my landlord just wanted to rent to some family member. And he, I don't know if she had a month to month or a lease, but it could have been a lease because I think she had some advance notice and she was very upset because she lived there for years. And he basically just said, well, you know, I have a family member who needs the apartment. And it's so incredibly disruptive, like Carol said, I mean, or John with the woman he was quoting who said, you know, she and her daughter were suddenly gonna have to move. My daughter's on the line with me here because like I said, she's doing a project for history on housing. And, um, but I think historically it has been allowed to not have a reason, kind of like employment at will. Like I don't have to have a reason to fire you unless it's discriminatory, then I, then I can't, right? Because I can't fire you for being, you know, Jewish or black or whatever the, the reason is. Um, 
So like John said, and Nate, it'd be interesting to find out and Will, like what is the procedural posture? I'm a former lawyer too, now I teach um, about, was it the pandemic where they said, oh, we're not gonna have any no, uh, no fault evictions are not permitted during the pandemic, but when this is over, the state of emergency, we could go back to that maybe the wild west of like, well, too bad for you, you're out because I need the apartment. So I know Carol was saying, you know, she's concerned about that, but I think it's always been like that, hasn't it, Carol? I don't know. I assumed that that meant you could be evict someone while they were within a lease. If you don't have a lease, if you have an, a, like, an, like employment at will, as you said, but if you have, if you're on a month to month thing, then you know that you're on a month to month thing. So you presumably that's the way that you, you it's not a surprise, but I didn't yeah. think, I thought eviction was I'm getting you out of here, even though the lease isn't over with, even though you're still in this contract period, but I'm, and I then so then doing it with no fault means I can do it. It just means there's no point to a lease to me. If you can do that during the period of time of a lease, if you can evict somebody for no reason while they have a lease, what the hell is the point of a lease? Oh, it doesn't yeah. even mean anything. So I wouldn't think that would be it. That sounds terrible. I know that's what I thought it was saying. And it's probably just me being naive. So yeah. Okay, so we're in, in the middle of a motion uh, <laughs> to send a letter opposing no fault eviction. And uh, is there any further discussion of that or are we ready for a vote? Oh, sounds good. OK, so we'll uh, take a vote. Uh, Erica, yes or no? Yes. Carol? Yes. Rob? Yes. Will? Yes. Allegra? Yes. yes. OK, you're nodding your head, yes. OK, and I'm a yes. So again, that's six to zero. And I will ask uh, Will to provide me with a draft of a letter. Um, which I can send to, again, the appropriate parties. Okay, the next item I wanted to move on to is one that Allegra is involved in. The town manager appointed a committee to look for a permanent place for the seasonal shelter in Amherst. And Allegra is, what, one of seven members of that committee? When I, I won't, I'll stop talking and give you a chance to tell us what's going on. Um. So we had our first meeting a few weeks ago um, and we are meeting again tomorrow. Um, but it was Mary Beth from this, who's the director of senior services, Kevin Noonan from Craig Stores, Jay Levy from Elliott Homeless Services and Kim Alley who works at the Greenfield Savings Bank. Um, and I believe Lev Ben Ezra from the Survival Center had been invited onto the committee as well and they were still looking for potential other contributors. Um, so our first kind of charge is to find a place for Craig's Doors to operate over this fall, winter season. Um, and then by the end of 2021, we are to present some more permanent ideas for where a shelter could operate. Um, and the group did discuss the idea of also strongly recommending to the town to have ongoing support of affordable housing, either development or by fostering relationships with landlords who would be able to accept vouchers. Um, and then also kind of thinking about rapid rehousing as well. Um, so that was, I mean, that was really all we did. The first meeting was kind of talk about the charge and you know, what, I guess the, the only other thing that came up was the idea of the congregate shelter that was run over the winter versus the, um, how the motels had been going um, because they had used the University Lodge and I think the Econo Lodge in Hadley as placements um, to help during COVID with distancing and people who might be more compromised. Um, and I believe because the state of emergency is ending, the FEMA money that has been funding that is going away. Um, so that was something that they were also trying to figure out what, 
and how is that going to be funded if that is going to be funded further. Um, there's some talk about a number of emergency housing vouchers coming down through stimulus. I believe it looked like maybe seven for all of Hampshire County from the numbers that I had seen. Um, but basically the long chart is that's what we're going to do. We have not formally identified a location as of yet. <laughs> so good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any possibilities? I don't know how we're funding this either, so that's. <laughs> yeah. Are there any possibilities that are proposed, Allegra? Um, it sounded like Kevin was doing some work. Um, he did not identify to the group yet any of the places that he had been talking about. Perhaps we'll hear more about that tomorrow. There's an old school in North Amherst, which was the last home of the Amherst uh, Survival Center before they moved into their current location. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there is still some use of those for storage and for offices. And I heard people talk about that at one point. You're looking quizzical, so that's something that hasn't come to you, apparently. <laughs> nope, <laughs> but that doesn't mean anything either. <laughs> so you said you had to have a report, preliminary report to the town manager by the end of 2021? So for the permanent site. Um, the, I think the due date is December 31st. And oh, December 31st, because I was thinking the end of the fiscal year is this month. Right. So uh -huh. that's a little soon. And actually for the for finding the site for this winter, it's July 31st is the date by which we've been told to produce results. So. Uh -huh. Okay, so you don't have anything to report for what's potentially under consideration. I do not. I thought they had a contract for, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but the old motel that's unused in the center of town for another year. I had seen that number somewhere too <coughs> in 2022, but I don't remember where I saw that number. It wasn't discussed during our first meeting, so. Okay. And I there, think we're looking for siting for the congregate shelter was my understanding, although I know that has also been extended at the church for a little bit longer, at least. So, Okay, so the it's the uh, um, Unitarian Universalist Society, right? Yeah. That's where it's been, and they're going to be allowed to use that for, you think, another season? I don't believe another season. I believe a little bit longer this season. I oh, of the exact date. Because this season started. ended, I thought, on April 30th. Right. And I know it's been extended a little bit into the other way in June. <laughs> okay. What are the numbers you're looking at in terms of uh, congregate spaces, male, female? I honestly don't even have that information. Um, I think Craig Stores has a record number for them mm -hmm. of individuals who are homeless between the three locations. Yeah. The, the UU, the old Amherst Motel, or not, that's not what it was, the University Motel. University Lodge. And, and uh, the O'Connell Lodge. They had more people they housed this past season than they've ever housed before. Mm -hmm. Um, the number of units they have and had in the past was generally somewhere between 28 and a little over 30. And now they were housing, I think, more than 40 people on an average night. Wow. Yeah, I think. Or more. Yeah, as a group, uh, Allegra, fo yeah, focus in kind of what the programmatic needs are. So like, right, number of beds, mm -hmm. facility size, you know, what are they looking for? And then identifying a site because you know it doesn't necessarily have to be new development it could be an existing facility or building you know uh, Craig's doors is receiving block grant money and Kevin gave an update uh, the other week and I thought he said that the UU was done if not now soon right. and they're hoping to extend the contract with yeah, the motor lodge or one of those but you know I think he had said that come this winter right now they don't have a they don't have they haven't secured a, a spot yet right. um, I think they're working on it but they don't have it secured. I guess the other question I was ha I had with this group is, 
is the expectation that it's going to be run or, or managed by Craig's doors or is it just, you know, is it, is it a town? Is it going to be a town thing or who's, I got, you know, cause I, I was part of a previous work years ago now on identifying sites for shelter, but you know, you know, for instance, like, is the town going to buy it or help is, or is Craig's doors doing it? I guess I'm, you know, I think I'm a little confused too about kind of the roles of everyone involved. Um, anyways. These are excellent questions. Um, and I think part of what we're also supposed to look at is like, is this going to be a site that is operating during the day as well so that there are services on site right. and, and who's staffing that and, and who's paying for it? I think those are all questions that have yet to be asked or answered. In right, yeah, you know, I think because of a big question. So you have, you have a day center and then a permanent shelter. So I mean, they're almost two separate, it could be two separate things. Right. Uh, you know, they might be run by the same agency, but programmatically they have different purposes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's a big task. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have a month or two for the first. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> You're meeting daily, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, that's that's the update I have. Not much of one. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you for being there and doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Allegra. Um, should we invite Kevin to talk to us next month about what's happened this past season generally? and what he expects yeah i think that's yeah because i think going back to the powers and uh stat you know the authorities of the trust i think when the trust was expanded to nine members you know an additional responsibility was put in to help ensure the operations of a shelter in amherst something to that effect so i think it would be important to have kevin or you know craig stores come in and give an update okay I would agree because I mean, it, homelessness is pandemic, and I, you know, this is this is huge. And seeing the people turned out in the morning, walking downtown trying to find, I mean, a lot of them look so disoriented. And if we're talking about evictions at the same time, you know, we definitely, I think, this is this is important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, I will definitely invite Kevin. I don't think we have to take a vote on that. Sure. My sense is that people um, would like to hear from them. Uh, Chad has his hand raised, John. Oh, okay, Chad. Hey, Chad, you can unmute yourself. Or maybe it's not Chad, it's just Mac user. It's Chad. Mac user, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, George Ryan has talked about this. Uh, I don't know how far he's gotten, but it'd be a great place for interdepartmental communication between you guys and town council. Um, talking about having a permanent uh, shelter in town instead of a partial. Now it's at a crisis because maybe even the partial is going to go away. Uh, Mass Housing and Sheltering, a, a statewide organization, has come up with um, a module approach which um, you can retrofit into um, existing buildings uh, as needed. Uh, the modules are packages that you can wait and hold in abeyance until needed. Uh, it's reduced the cost because it's factory built prefab. Um, so you can have a, a, a full building, whether it be new construction or, um, you know, like I was saying, re, re, um, retrofitting a building. And then lastly, um, with the environmental crisis that we're in um, getting worse and worse, uh, there's a national movement for something called resilience centers. Um, I don't know of anybody who's doing this, but what a resilience center is, is a place where um, your citizens of your town can rush to a, you know, out of a flood, can rush into a building that's ready and waiting for them. Um, I'm wondering, you know, Northampton is, is on the verge of building something like this for their citizens. I'm wondering if something like that could not be, um, you know, uh, expandable, contractable, whatever but used as a shelter in, when we're not under a, a flood, a hurricane, a nuclear power plant explosion, et cetera. So those are just some ideas. Okay, thanks, Chad. We do need, um, you know, you were talking about where are we going in the future? Um, the 
uh, the housing production plan and the other uh, privately amorous contracted study uh, all say what our needs are. Um, right now we're talking about the neediest of the needy. My belief is we triage them first because of the high rate of death of these people dying on the streets. So it's good to, uh, you know, triage the most needy first. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Thank Jeff. You. Okay, I'm gonna move on. We have two agenda items left and I'd like to get to both of them. Um, one involves the two uh, forums that we had. My granddaughter is studying Latin and I asked her what the plural of forum is and she couldn't answer the question. <laughs> so if anybody else can, that would be helpful. But in the interim, I'll continue to discuss them as forums. Uh, I wondered what people thought of them and what you felt we learned and what we might think about doing as next steps. I mean, I found them really interesting. I will say, I mean, there were some things that I already knew a lot about like home ownership, but it was still good to hear the detail from the three organizations that are doing that. Um, and uh, I probably knew the least about the sustainability and climate change topic. So there was a lot of new information for me there. Um, and uh, racial equity and housing was kind of somewhere in between. So personally, I found them interesting and certainly worth doing. And uh, I'm not clear necessarily on what we or anybody should do next. Um, but if I came away with anything that really hasn't been on our priority list or anybody else's, it would have to do with improving the quality of rental housing for low-income people in Amherst. There's a lot of rental housing. Um, the, as I understand it, many of the tenants bear significant costs for heating in the winter and cooling in the summer. Um, because they are uh, poorly designed and poorly insulated and uh, as, as well as being generally quite costly. And if I was to pick out anything that I hadn't necessarily been thinking about before, it would be to develop a program that addresses some of those kinds of issues for people in town who are living uh, in those facilities. Uh, I don't know, what are the issues that other people took away? I think, you know, Keith uh, Ferry from Wayfinders did a great job of summarizing the newer data from, you know, Mass Donahue Institute about um, kind of the legacy of discriminatory practices. So if you look at one or two statistics in isolation, it might not show much, but if you look at then, you know, the statistics of home ownership and renters and then wages and income and, you know, proportion of who's spending what on rent or living, it, you know, it paints a really clear picture that, um, you know, so, you know, so I, that the persons of color and indigenous uh, populations are really discriminated against. So, you know, I, I thought that was really powerful because it just makes me think like, okay, what, you know, and we heard it, we heard it from some of the, you know, the moderator even had a story, you know, personal story. So, um, you know, it, it just made me think about education or advocacy. Um, you know, we did a, we did a, uh, a landlord forum, you know, Nancy did that. We, this was um, probably a while ago, I think it was before COVID, right? We sent a, we had a distribution to all the, everyone on the rental registration and it was, Jay, Jay helped, but it was like, you know, Kind of trying to dispel myths of renting to low-income people you know like if it's not you know and so i feel like we could do some things around that you know just more education and outreach um you know i i because i think john it's interesting when you said about the the apartments my thought is like you know a lot of the newer developments like beacon and wayfinders they actually make nice units and so mm -hmm. the units that are uh more costly to live in are probably older units or single family homes that are rented or things that maybe the property owners may or may not be willing to take money to fix the homes up. You know, I was thinking that they could take, 
block grant money to rehab homes, but then it's, you know, there's de-letting and they have to have a re deed restriction on the property. But if we could do, you know, I think that's important, but I was also thinking through some of the, um, the forums, like I feel like there's a lot of just education that still needs to happen, you know, on, on a number of fronts, right? Not just equality and equity, but, you know, right. Insulating your homes or letting homeowners know or landlords, what are the programs they could use? I mean, they could, you know, even a, even a landlord could do mass save energy audits. I mean, you know, it doesn't benefit them necessarily, but it will benefit their tenants. And so I don't know, I just feel like those are the things that we could, we could I don't know, we somehow advocate for or, or publicize. Yeah, it's a good point. I think our poorest attendant was on the climate when we had about 35 people, plus or minus two for that one. And for racial equity and housing, we had close to 70 people and the home ownership one was somewhere in between. I think I learned the most from the climate one, um, but I think the, I think the challenge often is, um, even though they talked about how affordable it is, uh, it still sometimes seems like um, you have to jump through hoops to get things. And <laughs> so, I mean, I'm you work a, for government, Erica. Oh, <laughs> you certainly do have to jump through hoops. Bureaucracy is the way you don't get anything. Uh, oh, did I say that? Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I learned a lot and it was great, but even when they say low cost for, you know, for some people, they put everything into buying a house, especially possibly later in life, and it's still expensive. Um, so, and then some of the language and some of the ideas were still like, you know, there were there were people who understood it very easily and it still wasn't user-friendly, um, but I did learn so much and, you know, came back home and started talking about all things that we need to do here. Um, so I think there's gotta be a way um, because I think there are a lot of people who don't know um, of all the resources that are out there to create, you know, a more insulated house, a more energy efficient house. And so not only are they doing good things for the environment, but they're also reducing their, you know, using the money for paying for energy resources. Um, but it's often an upfront investment in the long term, there you save. And that's hard sometimes when you don't have the upfront investment. So um, I think a little bit more needs to be done around user friendly and getting the information out in a very simple way and not um, in helping people not have to go through hoops. But all three were phenomenal. Um, and the one, um, the one on um, racial equity and housing, there was some history there about Amherst that I had no idea about. So that, that was very fascinating. Any other comments or thoughts? Okay, so then we'll move on to development. Um, John, there, Susan has oh, her hand raised. Oh, okay, Susan. Oh, yeah. Picking up on what Erica said, um, you know, I recently read The Color of Law uh, by Richard Rothstein about the institutional um, background of, of segregation and how, you know, people in authority, lawyers and powerful people put rules in effect that then you know, get blamed on average people when there's racism. But more to the point, I think a lot of people don't know how to access services, Erica, like you said. It's amazing, like whether it's a climate change thing or whether it's knowing that they don't have to put up with, like John said, certain conditions in their apartment. Um, a lot of people, even like when I lived in East Longmeadow, I think I might have mentioned this, there was a woman who I was talking to about a foreclosure and she literally thought that they were gonna come put her furniture out, you know, in the street. She didn't know the whole process, like, well, they have to come and serve you a notice to quit, and then they have to evict you, and you have defenses. And, and I think a lot of people of color, indigenous people, you know, I see, like, I work in Fitchburg, um, and the population is pretty much half Latinx, an incredible amount of deference, you know, toward teachers, toward people in positions of power, toward landlords. So maybe some kind of... Um, you know, practical workshop about how do you access government services and why you're entitled to them and who would be the person who could help you and almost just like um, 
bolstering people's confidence that they're entitled to this and that they should not be afraid. I mean, even the fact that John said there's so few people have applied or have thought, well, I have to use my savings or I can't. I mean, that's a whole different thing. They might just be proud, you know, they might, but anyway, that's, I just wanted to say that. Okay, thanks, Susan. Um, so let me move on to the last thing, which has to do with the pipeline for affordable housing development. Nate wanted to give an update on Belchertown Road and East Street, and I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about where we go next, now that we've resolved Belchertown Road, East Street. <laughs> well, I think the, um, yeah, thanks for meeting, you know, I guess it was a little over a week ago, the, uh, you know, the request for a proposal was finalized and sent to staff and uh, legal counsel for review. Um, so that's underway. The, um, you know, one question I had of the trust that came up recently is that now the town's, you know, a property owner and there's electric bills and property maintenance fees uh, that the town, you know, the assumption is that the trust would cover with the unrestricted account. Um, the thought would be it'd be at most 5,000, more likely two to 3,000 over the next six months. And then uh, it would become, you know, in the request for proposals, it becomes the developer's responsibility to carry the, the, the cost of the property. But, um, you know, I think we would need a vote of the trust to allow, you know, that expense, you know, you could say up to a maximum of 5,000 or 4,000 for the next six months. The, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's moving forward, you know, where, uh, you know, the, the, our, the request for proposal changed to uh, require the reuse of the school building. And then if that didn't, uh, um, if that wasn't fruitful, then perhaps amending the RFP and not reissuing a new one and then, you know, changing the parameters of the, of, of the, of the request. And so, um, you know, I was thinking that it would be, it could get out this month. I, you know, I'm not, it's not, it's not, you know, it's the town manager's decision, but I feel like it's, I feel like the document was, was good. I mean, I guess, you know, people could have different opinions about sections or things, but I feel like in terms of what was presented was a really thorough document. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's kind of it. Uh, okay. So basically there's two things there. We're hoping that the RFP is formally issued by the end of this month. Uh, I hope that happens. Uh, I think it was, if not a perfect document, as close as we were going to get, and that it definitely deserves to see the light of day. Uh, so I hope that happens very shortly. Um, the other thing Nate brought up is that uh, uh, the town does need to cover the costs of uh, particularly, I guess it's the Belchtown Road site, which has two houses on it and a certain bit of property maintenance that's a part of that. Um, and the town wants to continue uh, a contract with the organization that's already been maintaining that property. Nate estimates the cost would be a few thousand dollars over the next six months. So I guess I'm gonna move that we authorize the expenditure of trust funds up to five thousand dollars for the next six months to cover those maintenance costs is there a second there's a Nobody. second but i thought we had already done that but there's a second I, yeah i thought maybe we had two but nate didn't seem to think so so yeah i mean the trust had voted to um you know i think it was up to twenty thousand for the properties but to me that was more say site feasibility work or other things. I just want to you know, have a clearer vote. Accounting's been really making sure we have a clear vote whenever the trust spends money now. So we may see more votes coming back to the trust just so you know, it's clear to the town. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, I think I, Erica did second. So I'm gonna take a formal vote. Uh, I'm a yes. Erica, yes. Carol, yes. Yes. Rob, yes. Allegra, yes. And Will, yes. And I have okay. a, a, are there people still living in those houses or one of them? 
No, I think everybody moved out oh, okay. by the end of May. Thanks, That's what John. I recall okay. hearing from Rob. Is that right? Thanks, John. Yeah, maybe the trust did vote, but I'm glad we just had another vote just to make sure. Um, yeah, I know the the one property on 72 Belchertown Road was vacated, you know, a long time ago because the owner didn't want, he knew he was trying to sell. And then the 80 Belchertown Road, which is the brown cape closer to the road, they were told in their lease agreement that they couldn't renew the lease at the end of May or June. Um, and, but the owner had asked them if they, they had to give notice last October if they wanted to renew or find housing and they, they indicated no. So, you know, if they had said yes, then, you know, the town and the owner maybe, you know, could have helped relocate them or they were all graduating uh, undergrads from UMass. So they were, oh, they okay. were ways. And I think the owner, you know, I don't know if he tried to find students who wouldn't stay longer than a year, but um, the rent management company said it was clear when they were showing the unit that it was only for a year. So, you know, they were pretty clear up front that they, you know, the owner, even after, if the town didn't buy the property, I think the owner was not going to rent it again. That I mean, it says it in the lease actually, um, which is pretty unusual. You know, in Amherst, you'd want to secure a tenant. I mean, wouldn't it be ideal to get a tenant that's going to stay for two years, but they're clear that they were going to leave after a year. So no one's there. Okay. Yeah. So the maintenance would be like, you know, electricity has to stay on to maintain temperature, you know, maybe once a, once a month check just to have someone go in, make sure, you know, nothing's vandalized, you know, mow the lawn, you know, pretty basic, pretty minimal stuff. Um, you know, and if there's a major capital expense then that would kind of have to come back to the trust though. So. Okay. So the next agenda item is what's next. As I said, now that we've completed the work on Belchertown Road and East Street as a development, we hope that goes through. Um, but we really, that means need to be thinking about and really acting on the next project. At least that's my judgment. Did you say there was some little update on uh, 132 or not? Maybe no, I didn't. didn't even say that. Okay, my no, mistake, I didn't. sorry. As okay. far as I know, um, they're still in, in, waiting for uh, feedback from the Department of Housing and Community Development on the uh, uh, subsidy application they've made to support the development of that property. And I don't think that's going to come for another month or two. That's what I recall Laura saying. Uh, Laura was on. Is she on still? She uh, is. She's she there. Is. She may not know either. I mean, it would be, you know, it's a pretty fast turnaround. Um, you know, so usually, you know, you apply for funding in February or March, and then it takes many months to hear. Um, but... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, Sorry. So what do we do next? And for me, the obvious candidate is this piece of property that's sitting on Strong Street. Um, it's been there for a while. The town owns it. It was originally going to be developed by someone who uh, wasn't able to follow through, um, stopped paying taxes, and so the property defaulted to the town. There's a several acres there. I can't remember exactly how much. Um, it was laid out for a development. There is no real roadway into the property. There's a little bit of a dirt road that uh, one of the existing houses that's just off Strong Street uses maybe more than one, but I think it's only one or at most two. So the question is, can we develop something there? Um, could it be a home ownership development? Could it be uh, a rental development? Since it's not on public transportation, my own instinct, and that's all it is in an instinct, because I really haven't evaluated the property, would be to say, if we could do a low income home ownership development where we assume people would have cars to get in and out of the property, uh, to go to work, to go to town, to go wherever it is they need to go, that that would be a better idea than a low income rental development. But I'm not saying it has to be one or the other. What I wanna suggest is that we need to have a proper evaluation of the property done in order to determine whether we can do an affordable housing development 
either for rental or for home ownership. And that would include evaluating the property potentially for wetlands, uh, for whether there are other aspects of the property that would make it difficult uh, or impossible potentially to build upon. Um, what are the unmet needs of the site in addition to the access road? I don't believe there are any utilities that actually come into the middle of the site. Um, they're obviously close by. So all of those things are things that um, need to be addressed if we're gonna move forward with this. So my inclination is that at the moment, that's our best opportunity and that we should be uh, pursuing it. Questions, comments? I think we were talking a little bit about that when I first came on the trust maybe, and then for various reasons, I don't know, it was a bad time to do some kind of testing or something. And we found a lot of other things to do, but yeah, it's been sitting there for a while. Yeah, I think the town's owned it for probably a decade, maybe more. Is it possible to think about small houses there to get more units there? Yeah, I like that idea. It could be small houses. It could be condos. It could be any number of things. Um, and at this point, I don't want to presuppose what it will be. I mean, I yeah, guess I have is. my own biases and preferences, but uh, I don't necessarily expect everybody to share those. Yeah, there's 11, I mean, kind of, you know, it's really like one or two lots, but there was 11 lots proposed and, you know, the subdivision was hard to develop, whether it was cost or, you know, ledge or wetland topography, whatever. But, you know, I think Rob also had suggested that this could be a site where maybe some of the lots are sold and the trust could actually take the proceeds and there's still a few lots that could be used by habitat or some, you know, there's probably a number, a combination of, of um, you know, paths. So I think, yeah, I agree, John. I think probably some of the initial assessments of wetlands, kind of test pits, you know, soil, soils, utilities, those are the things that could probably help determine how buildable it is. Um, and, and I will say that the town had gone out there and um, the neighbors were pretty, you know, they were, so, this, yeah, this is, you know, gosh, almost two years ago, uh, the staff had gone out there once or twice and the neighbors were really concerned. You know, they, they met staff and, you know, I think just because it's been undeveloped for so long, they just, and, then, and some of the lots are, you know, adjacent to the properties, they, you know, it feels like it's their, their property. Um, so they were really surprised um, and really nervous. So, you know, if, if this, if this is something that's moving forward, I think there's probably has to be some type of, you know, some, some meetings with the neighbors too, because, you know, they're used to having a quiet dirt road, that's really their private driveway, and then, you know, 13 acres of a backyard that, yeah. yeah. That's lovely, Nate. More fun and games with the neighbors. Yeah. yeah, yeah that, I mean, that, no, Dave, Dave Z was out there once and, you know, two houses, they must have seen him coming. And so two neighbors, like quickly, it was like before he could even like get down the driveway, they're already there uh, waiting. Like, oh, okay. Okay, well, um, you know, as with any neighborhood, it's something we're gonna have to deal with. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, cause I think, yeah, I agree, I think, but I, yeah, I mean, it's a private, I guess it's a private way. I'm looking on the GIS right now. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of questions about access, you know, can that be, is that gonna be improved to be a, to a, be a big paved road? You know, what are the impacts to the neighbors? So I do think those are all valid. Um, that's something that, you know, the trust could pay for, right? We could have some, some studies done. Um, and I think the trust would have to make a, a request of the town that, that it go through the disposition process, right? So the town adopted a disposition process for municipal property where it would look at the number of you know, options or uses for a property and then determine what it wanted to do. So, I mean, I feel like we could say that given a number of factors that this isn't necessarily a prime location for certain municipal uses, right? Like it's not great for a fire station or public works. 
Uh, right. You West. think you have problems with putting housing there, putting the DPW there <laughs> would be absolutely outrageous. <laughs> Yeah, it's just and it's it's it is it's on a it's on a hill too. I will say that. Yeah, I, I feel like it, it would take a pretty good. You know, I think it does need some assessment, but um, it's, I think it's worth it. Well, okay. I I guess um, I'm going to move that the we the trust authorized expenditure is up to thirty thousand dollars for uh, evaluation services, including wetlands, soil. Uh, utilities, the access road, and really anything else that would be needed to determine whether we could do an affordable housing development on that site. And that would come back with uh, some specific ideas about what is and what is not possible on that site. And that it might involve more than a single contractor. Uh, Although I suppose we could have a general contractor who hires some subs to do some of the pieces of it. Do we have to, I, I'm totally, that seems great. I just wondered if there's anything we have to do uh, with the town since it's not, it's the town's land and the town may do, it has to be okay with the town that we do this, I guess, or something, or they don't, yeah, if you should see my screen, you know, there's here's Strong Street right here. So there's this little property, you know, this one, uh, this big one, and then this one. So I think it's about 13, you know, total acres. Um, you know, that's that's part of this property. There's this is privately owned. <laughs> that was kind of funny. There's a little chunk of something. Um, and so yeah, you know, this had proposed to be a, you know the subdivision road coming in, and then. You know, you can see this here if I go to a different map. So you can see the topography, though. It's a pretty, pretty big hillside. Steep. Steep, yeah. And originally it was, um, you know, proposed to be a subdivision, right, with all these lots on it. And it looks like these, it looks like this lot, this lot was bought by someone who maybe thought they were going to be at the end of the road. And it never, you know, it just never happened. <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. But. Well, Carol, you're right. We would have to eventually go through a process that we went through with the E Street School site. That is, we went before town council and asked them to give the trust and the town manager the authority to go forward with an affordable housing development. So at some point, yes, if we decide that this is developable, we would have to go before town council and ask them to authorize the use of the land for that purpose. I guess we just, like, maybe we know this already, but we'd just like to know that they don't, the town doesn't have already some other thing they're thinking of doing. That would mean that we just spent $30,000, but they already knew they weren't gonna look at it anyway or something. You know what, I, I, probably a silly thing to worry about, but I'd like to not spend the money if there's already some reason why we know it won't work before we even start. Well, as Nate said, there is a uh, intra-governmental group that's looking at what uh, town properties could be used for. And they don't meet very often. And in fact, we kind of bypassed that group when it came to the East Street School site because they just decided, ah, oh, go ahead with it. Uh, and I suspect this would be the same, but it's okay. really a question of, checking with the assistant town manager to see if something has gone forward without Nate's knowledge, which frankly, I think is unlikely. Yeah, but I think, uh, Carol, to your point, I think if the trust voted the money, I think, John, then kind of implicit in that would be a request to the town that this property be used for affordable housing. I think that would start uh, kind of this internal process of saying, okay, well, you know, we have one uh, proposed use what are other possible uses? And so I think before, yeah, I would, I, I, I agree, Carol. I think before the trust or I would hire a consultant, we'd want to have some discussions with the town manager's office and whoever else is involved, you know, knowing that there's, the housing has a, right, a fair shot at it. We're not, you know, 
I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything, but there could be something, right? I mean, there may be, you know, a lot of other entities looking at this saying, wow, there's 13 acres. What, what could happen? Um, yeah, I, it's possible. But uh, in addition to talking to the town, I think what we should be expecting is the town expedite this review. So we're able to conduct those evaluations if there isn't another obvious use for that site that's under consideration. That's fine, that's good. How did you come up with the $30,000 figure? Uh, well, it's an attempt to be safe. We've spent uh, typically four or $5,000 on wetlands analysis. I don't know if we've had soil analysis, but I was guessing, okay, it could be the same. Um, there are some things that are really unknown about the site, which is, like I said, um, where you, whether you can put a road on the obvious place where there's a dirt road access now, um, what you need to do in order to uh, make utilities accessible to anything you built there. Um, and again, the potential types of affordable housing that we could do there, you add it all up, I'm guessing it's at least $20,000 and it could be more. So I put a cap of 30 on it, Rob. That's, that's, a, that's close enough for government work, I think. <laughs> Do you have to do anything because there's a railroad that goes right uh, part of it? Any no, story? I think the, um, you know, depending on the funding source and how it's developed, you know, you'd have to have uh, possibly some mitigation if, if it's deemed that the railroad is um, too loud. So, you know, when Olympia Oaks even went in uh, further north, you know, because it was within a certain distance that we actually, um, the, the you know wayfinders actually hi hired someone to do like noise you know attenuation and and readings when the train went by to show that it wasn't uh you know a nuisance or you know so i think yeah i i noticed that too eric i think that if if this are moving forward for housing depending on the funding source they would have to do some type of you know um review of that um there's also power lines that run very close to the property, not through it, but next to it, I believe, or if not next to it, then pretty close. Yeah, next um, to the, right, yeah, next to the train tracks coming into the property, right, it's, um, there are power lines, right, that there's a little sliver of land owned by Western Mass Electric. Yep. Any, any report that is produced, um, I would hope that it's produced in this way, not, so that not, so that it just doesn't just inform us, but also can be used to inform someone who might be bidding on an RFP if we end up doing an RFP. It has to be informative enough for someone else to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That's what Carol was talking about before in terms of pre-development work that so we understand what's there and we can share that to developer so they don't have to assume the same costs and uh, yeah, we set things up so that they can move in if it becomes appropriate to do that. Okay, so I made a motion that we proceed with a cap of $30,000 to work on evaluation of the Strong Street property. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second it. Okay, uh, any further discussion or should we come to a vote? You just begin the process with some kind of conversation with town or Nate does or something. Yeah, yeah I'll send a formal note to the town manager cool. and the assistant town manager saying, assuming we approve this, that we voted to do that. And we would like to know uh, whether or not they have another potential use or whether we should move forward to do the evaluation for affordable Perfect. housing development. Perfect. Okay, any other questions or discussion? Well, then I guess we're ready for a vote. Will? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Rob? Yes. Carol? Yes. Erica? Yes. 
and I'm a yes, so that makes it six to zero. Um, so I think we're probably past nine o'clock. There's one other thing I wanted to mention. If anybody goes and looks at the website for the Affordable Housing Trust, you'll find that it shows each of our names and when our terms end. Uh, the reason I'm raising that is because my term ends about a year from now. No. And, <laughs> and as of that point, I will have served at least six years on the Affordable Housing Trust, plus a few years earlier than that on the Housing and Sheltering Committee. And so I think we should begin to think about transition planning. And so if anybody has someone else in mind who might step up to become co-chair of the Housing Trust in the next few months, uh, preparatory to becoming chair in a year or so, uh, I think that would be a good discussion for us to have. So if anybody's interested in that, you can communicate with myself or with Nate directly, and then we can talk about that as a group and some future date. Yeah, no, actually, John, that's a good segue. Usually every year, the boards and committees are supposed to vote a new chair, vice chair, clerk, whatever, officers. And so, you know, July, September, or July, August, September, the trust should vote, you know, a new set of officers. Um, so probably sooner than, you know, John can remain chair if he wants, but, you know, at least if he doesn't um, seek reappointment, then, you know, someone else. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's just something to consider. Every year we should do it just... I think the town's going to try to be better about reminding boards and committees of that. Um, I just want to say Erica typed in the chat about, you know, the golf course. So yeah, Hickory Ridge is still something that the town hasn't purchased, but uh, I think is expecting to purchase in the fall. Now it, it, it keeps getting pushed back, but yeah, I think the, um, they're planning, you know, some type of public process. So I think the trust, we can just stay, you know, we can try to stay informed of that. Yeah. yeah it's not, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure the town will buy it. It's just funny that, you know, I thought it was, you know, months ago and then, so I, I've heard that by September, uh, it'll, it should happen, but. Well, that's good to know. Maybe next month we could talk about a process for developing a plan for what we would do with uh, part of that site that's uh, right on West Pomeroy Lane. So yeah. we have something to contribute to the public process. Yeah, I think that's a, yeah, that'll be competitive. I think, you know, there's a number of town departments and, you know, there's outside organizations too also looking at that. So I think that's a, you know, there's so many, a few acres on the front that people have been looking at. Okay, any other last moment comments? Anyone, thing anybody wants to add? Okay, thank you all for your participation. It's been a good meeting. And we will see you 